cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone.
If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and grab it. Turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, we're going to read verses 1 to 8. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Hear the word of God. When the Sabbath was was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him, him being Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from, for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before them to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out. And fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The words of God. On Friday, we read together the narrative, the passion story as told by the gospel writer Mark. This morning, we pick up his account of Jesus' resurrection. The entire Gospel of Mark seeks to answer one simple question. Who is Jesus? And throughout its 16 chapters, Mark answers that question in many different ways. Through his baptism, Mark shows that Jesus is the Son of God in his Temptation, Mark, shows that Jesus is human, tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is shown as a miracle worker, healing all kinds of ailments. Jesus is a friend to sinners. He ate and he communed with the outcasts of society. Mark showed that Jesus is a great teacher through the many parables that he told. He also showed us that Jesus was largely misunderstood. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was transformed before his disciples' eyes. Mark showed us that Jesus is a servant He came not to be served, but to serve. And as Mark nears the end of his gospel, he shines light on the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Mark shows us that Jesus was crucified for the sins of the world. And even though Mark's gospel, it's only 16 chapters long, 30% of Mark's gospel is dedicated to one week of Jesus' life. It's almost like he rushed through the first three years of Jesus' ministry so he could get to and spend time on that one week we call Holy Week. He could spend on that one week of Jesus' life. 20% of Mark's gospel is dedicated to Good Friday. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is human. Jesus is a healer, a miracle worker. He's a friend to sinners. He's a great teacher. Jesus was misunderstood. He was transformed. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus was crucified. But the story of Jesus... The story of Mark's gospel 
doesn't end with the crucified Jesus laying in a tomb. Because in Mark chapter 16, he gives us the account of a risen Jesus, which is his last answer to the question, who is Jesus? He's all of these things that we have mentioned before, but who is Jesus? He's risen indeed. And Mark, in his gospel, sets out to show that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is not a matter for debate. It's a historical event. On a given date, in a defined place, the man, Jesus, having been crucified, died, and buried two days earlier, came forth from the tomb. That same tomb that received his lifeless body late in the day on Friday. That tomb gave birth to the greatest message the world has ever heard. No doubt, no doubt the events of Friday left Jesus' followers confused, exhausted, and fearful. They were expecting triumph and they got tragedy. They were expecting a coronation, and instead, there was a crucifixion. And for them, it all happened so fast that they were in the garden, they were praying with Jesus, and then all of a sudden, soldiers were there, and they whisked Jesus away from the garden under cover of night. He was taken to the praetorium, he was beaten, he was taken to this place, and then to that place, to Herod, and to Pilate, and to Pilate, and to Herod. He was sentenced to death. He was whisked away to Calvary. Before they knew it, Jesus was crucified and he he had died. His followers were unprepared for all of it. No doubt they were reeling. The events of Friday, the uncertainty of Saturday. Man, what that Saturday must have felt like for them. They were particularly unprepared for his burial. According to Jewish custom, interment occurred immediately after death. Just as Jesus had died on the cross, his body was taken off the cross, and immediately he was placed in the tomb. They used spices and ointments in the burial process. They did not embalm bodies like we do today. Instead, they used perfumes and spices to counteract the stench of a rotting and decomposing body. However, since Jesus was buried late in the day, since he he was hastily buried on the Sabbath, remember Sabbath went from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, And since he was buried late in the day before sundown on Friday, his followers didn't have the opportunity to buy spices and perfumes in order to bury him properly. And so, as the Jewish custom was, after sundown on Saturday, but before dark, For a short time, stores would reopen. So on that Saturday night after sundown, but before dark, the women went to buy spices and perfumes. The women made good use of that short time they had available. They went to the shops. And they bought some spices and they bought some perfumes. And their plan was to go the next day, the first day of the week, Sunday. Their plan was to go to the tomb where Jesus was laid to rest. And give him a proper burial. And when they came to the tomb, they were expecting... They were expecting to find 
a body that had already been buried for a day and a half. There's this great juxtaposition between what the women were expecting and what they encountered. What they were What they encountered was vastly different than what they were expecting. They were expecting one final visit with their master. They were expecting to find a brutalized and beaten corpse. They were expecting to give their master the proper burial that he deserved. They were also expecting to find a very large stone. They thought that they would find a large stone that was rolled in front of the entrance of the tomb. Mark says late in chapter 15 that a large stone was rolled. And these women saw where Jesus was buried. They didn't go to the wrong tomb. They saw where Jesus was buried and they saw the stone rolled in front of the entrance. They were expecting to find that large stone blocking the entrance. It was actually the sole topic of conversation that day as they walked to the garden tomb. Who's going to roll it away? How are we, three women, how are we going to move it? Hopefully there's a gardener there or someone who can help us roll that stone away. We have to take note of these women. We have to take note of these three women. Because in just three paragraphs, in eight lines, Mark mentions these women by name three times. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. He mentions them three times. These women were there. Mark says these three women, they were there. As Jesus cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The women were there and they watched Jesus die. And then the very next paragraph, Mark writes it, These women were there. They saw, they saw where Jesus was buried. They saw the tomb. They saw the stone being rolled in front of the tomb. They were there. They saw Jesus' body laid to rest. The three women were there when all of Jesus' male disciples had been scattered and they fled out of fear. So three times in three paragraphs, three different events, these women who were there at the cross, who saw Jesus being laid in the tomb, are now there on Sunday morning, on the first day of the week, making their way back to the tomb to give Jesus a proper burial. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why did Mark repeat this so much? Three women's names, three times, three paragraphs. Well, I think that Mark is trying to prove the veracity of the event, the truth of the event. These three women were probably still alive when Mark wrote his gospel. So in effect, he's answering the skeptical question of, oh, did these events really take place? Did this really happen? And Mark is proactively saying, go talk to Mary. Go talk to Mary. Go talk to Salome. They were there. They were alive when this happened, and they witnessed it. And when no one else dared to go to Jesus' tomb, they went. They were expecting to administer last rites. They were expecting the tricky removal of a large stone. They were prepared to give Jesus a proper interment. But what they were expecting and what they encountered were vastly 
different. All of their preparations left them completely unprepared for what they encountered when they got to the tomb. What they intended to be a final visit turned out to be a commencement. Because the Jesus they looked for, they looked for him buried in a safe place. The Jesus they looked for was no longer there. Instead, when the women, when the women got to the tomb, they saw that the stone had already been moved. Unlike the other gospel writers, Mark makes no attempt to explain how the stone was moved. Mark simply states that it was already moved when the women got to the tomb. Mark makes it clear that the moving of the stone was a miracle in and of itself. The moving of the stone was a miracle in and of itself. The implication is that God himself moved that stone. So they were expecting a large stone, but the stone was no longer an obstacle. They were expecting to anoint Jesus' body and wrap his body with spices, but that wasn't there either. Instead, there was a young man dressed in white, presumably an angel, sitting where Jesus' body was laid to rest. The women were shocked. A repeated theme. But the angel brings a message. And he lets them in on a message and on something that they should have already known. Because this isn't the first time that they've heard about resurrection. Three times. Three times in his ministry, Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to die, and on the third day, he's going to rise again. That is what the conversation should have been on Sunday morning. As they made their way to the tomb, they should have been talking about, this is the third day. This is the third day. Jesus said he would rise again on the third day. That should have been the topic of conversation that day, but instead, the women were talking about the stone. And the young man, on that first Easter Sunday morning, preaches what is perhaps the simplest and most glorious message of the good news of Jesus Christ. The young man says, you're looking for Jesus. Jesus is a popular name, and so he, he narrows it down a little bit, and he says, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. But again, there, there were probably a lot of Jesuses in Nazareth. And so the angel really narrows it down, and he says, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was crucified. Ooh, that really narrows it down to one person. And the angel says, he's not here. He is risen, just as he said he would. Now, perhaps a more accurate translation would be, he has been raised. He is risen. It could mean that Jesus raised himself from the dead. But we have to realize that Jesus was as dead as dead can be. And his lifeless body was wrapped up and placed in a tomb. But it wasn't Jesus who raised himself from the dead. He wasn't swooning or he just passed out uh, for a, a few days. No, Jesus was, was dead. And it was God the Father who breathed new life into him, into his body. We have to pay attention to how thorough the angel's message is. He spoke, he speaks, spokes, he speaks of both Friday 
and Sunday. He speaks of both Friday and Sunday, both of suffering and victory. He speaks of death, but he also speaks of resurrection. In other words, there first has to be death before there can be resurrection. There has to be a sinless, perfect sacrifice before God can put his stamp of vindicating approval on Jesus' perfect work and bring him back from the dead. This is the message that the angel shared with the women that first day of the week. It's the same message the disciples preached. Read Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. It's the same message, and it's still the same message that we preach today. Jesus Christ, crucified, died, and buried for the forgiveness of sins. But the angel not only mentions resurrection. He also brings a message from Jesus himself. He brings a very positive message. He could have. He could have brought a very negative reprimand. You, those of little faith, faithless, traitorous, backstabbing cowards, you tell those guys. You tell those guys that Jesus is going to meet them in Galilee and he'll consider taking them back if they grovel. But they better grovel well. That message, quite honestly, would have been warranted. But that's not the message that Jesus gave them. Through the angel, Jesus passed along this message. I will see you soon. You are still mine. Even traitorous Peter needs to be there. I'm waiting for you. I want you back. Isn't that a beautiful message from the risen Jesus? to his disciples. The women women ran away from the tomb triumphant, and they told everyone they saw along the way. Nope. Nope, that's not what happens. Actually, Mark tells us that they were terrified and told no one. Terrified and told no one. And Mark actually has the audacity to end his gospel on this motif of fear, terror, and silence. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're looking at your Bible and you're saying, Michael, there are more verses there. Resurrection appearances are recorded in my Bible. And yes, they are. And well, I have no doubt that the verses 9 to the end of the chapter, while they are very old, the oldest and most reliable manuscripts of the book of Mark do not contain verses 9 to 20. There's a debate between the short ending of Mark and the long ending of Mark. All of the oldest manuscripts of Mark End at verse 8. It seems a little unsatisfying to us. It seems a little unsatisfying to us. And even early church historians recorded that Mark's gospel ends at verse 8. Linguistically, if, we, uh, if you knew Greek, if I knew Greek... Verses 9 to 20 introduce a bunch of words that weren't used in the previous chapters in Mark. And linguistically, the way the sentences are formed just doesn't add up. There are words used in verses 9 to 20 that just aren't used anywhere else in the previous 16, 15 and a half chapters in Mark. And so while the additional ending of Mark's gospel is undoubtedly very old, 
It is without a doubt not written by Mark himself. And while it may be an unsatisfying cliffhanger of an ending in our minds, Mark had a reason for ending his gospel this way. Let's examine why. Either the ending is intolerably clumsy, or it is subtle and powerful. Either it's intolerably clumsy or it is subtle and powerful. I choose subtle and powerful. You see, fear, fear and silence are appropriate responses when confronted with the divine intervention of God. If you read through Mark's gospel, you see... You see that when Jesus did something amazing, the people were amazed, they were shocked, and they were terrified. And the resurrection is no different. They saw the intervention of God, and they saw something amazing. And they were shocked, just like everyone else in the Gospel of Mark. Now, here's the irony of the situation. Here's the irony of the situation. If you read through Mark's gospel, there's there's something called the messianic secret throughout the entire gospel that when Jesus does a a miracle or he says something incredible, he says to people, no, shh, 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 keep that on the down low. You keep that quiet. And what inevitably happened is the people didn't keep it on the down low, and they shared it everywhere they went. Throughout the entire Gospel of Mark, Jesus was telling people to be quiet about who he was and why he came to earth. Open declaration has been prohibited throughout the Gospel of Mark. But now, now that veil of secrecy has been lifted, and open proclamation has been commanded. Go and tell the disciples... And the irony of the situation is that the women kept silent. Throughout the gospel, be quiet, don't tell anybody, and they told everybody. Now at the end of the gospel, tell everybody. And they didn't. But we know that the women didn't keep silent for long. We know that the women didn't keep silent for long. The other gospel writers tell us about Peter and John being at the tomb. They tell us about Jesus appearing to the disciples. The book of Acts is a testament to the fact that the women didn't keep silent for very long, but they started telling the disciples, and the disciples told everybody else. The writings of Paul are testament to the fact that the women eventually spread the message of the resurrection. 2,000 years of church History tells us that the message of the resurrection was spread. The fact that we are worshiping the risen Jesus today is proof that the message of the resurrection spread, and it spread like wildfire. But I think we still need to evaluate the ending of Mark. Is it clumsy or subtle? Did Mark all of a sudden forget how to write? Did his source die before he finished? Did he die before he finished? Or is the ending incredibly subtle? Powerful. You see, Mark chose not to end his gospel with a nice little bow, and they all lived happily ever after. Because Mark recognized the story isn't finished. His gospel, the ongoing good news of Jesus Christ, is an unfinished work. At the beginning of Mark's gospel, Right off the bat, he said that this gospel is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But nowhere does Mark record the end of the gospel. Now, 
So the resurrection isn't the end of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. It's the new beginning. The good news. And while the resurrection brings the narrative of Mark's gospel to a close, the resurrection doesn't end the story. And Mark's gospel forces us to enter that story. How would we react when faced with the news of Jesus' resurrection? Mark's ending forces us to reflect on our own response to the resurrection. How would we react? With fear? Skepticism? Silence? Are we like the fearful and silent women? We watch this video to the end and then tell no one of what you heard. You have a grand celebration, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then we just put everything back in the box and we forget about it again until next year. The women were commissioned to tell everyone they could, but they told no one. And when Mark records that, he wanted his original readers, he wanted us today to assume the responsibility of telling everyone. They were silent. You cannot be. This story, the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus, continues with us. It's like a baton that has been passed to us, a never-ending story that has been passed to us, which we have the responsibility of passing on to other people. We cannot let the story die. We are the next chapter. We cannot let the story of the resurrection become a faded memory that we dust off once a year and admire it. Mark's purpose for ending his gospel in this way was to challenge the followers of Jesus to live lives as witnesses for him. And if you're watching this video, you have heard the good news of the resurrection. What will you do with it? You hoard it to yourself. Keep silent. Be afraid of the mockery and the ridicule. Or, in obedience, will you spread the message of the resurrection and the victory that Jesus won over death? Will you continue the story by passing it on to anyone and everyone who will listen? The story of Jesus did not end that first Easter Sunday morning. It was but a new beginning. And the story continues today. And the story will continue until Jesus comes again. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the story of the resurrection. Thank you for the resurrection. The vindicating stamp of approval of Jesus' work on the cross. And Jesus, I thank you for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. Obedient to death, even death on a cross, so that we might live. We thank you for the fact that the resurrection took place. And I pray, God that you will give us the strength through your Holy Spirit to be bold in sharing this message of the resurrection with anyone and everyone 
who will listen. I pray that we won't be like the women who were fearful and silent, but that we will be joyful and loud. We will be courageous in sharing this message with the world around us. Thank you for the time that we've had together as your people to celebrate. I pray that everything that was said and done in our service today brings honor and glory to your great name. We pray these things in the powerful name of the risen Jesus. Amen. Is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame now robed in majesty, the radiance of perfect love, now shines for all to see. Your name, your name is victory.
was borrowed for three days. His body there was.